Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Mickey Dam, and today we're going to be talking about the six-part story, The Reign of Terror by Dennis Spooner. Now, Dennis Spooner is a big writer in the television business in Britain. He originally started off his career with Coronation Street before making his way into bigger projects like Doctor Who, Thunderbirds, and the Brit some British shows that have been forgotten by now, like The Doom Watch and the 60s show The Avengers, the spy one, not, not the big movie, superhero one. So this story is set during the French Revolution. Now, for those of you who don't know, there was a big uprising in the 18th century, I believe. They, they're, they're in Paris uh, long ago, and there was a massive uprising between the rebels and the government about how Paris should be run and stuff. It's not really explained too well. It's mainly, the story mainly focuses on um, people's reaction to, to the revolution and the, the, the reign of terror, as it's called, as, it, as the title is implied. So the story starts off with our crew trying to get Ian and Barbara back to the 1960s, reluctantly, by the way. The Doctor is very grumpy after the sensorites, or the transit to Venus, if we're talking about our chronological order in. And when they land, the Doctor decides that they should just get off the ship and the Doctor goes and travels somewhere else. However, Ian kind of bribes the Doctor into coming with it, to making sure, so he can have a drink. Yes, yeah, so the Doctor um, drinks alcohol. We don't actually see him in this story actually drink it, but I just find it really funny that he does. He does as well. During the third Doctor era, he drinks a lot. There's something that new who has seemed to have forgotten because there's a scene with the 11th Doctor drinks alcohol and he's disgusted by it. However, that's just a topic for another day. Anyway, so the Doctor's bribed into <laughs> traveling uh, the 60s because he wants, he wants a drink. However, as, as I've already told, uh, this story isn't actually set in the 1960s. The Doctor miscoursed for Paris during the French Revolution and they find a little house and they befriend not surprisingly, by these two guys who who were very suspicious of them, who they are they are part of the resistance. And as the doctor stumbles up some stairs, he gets knocked out by one of them, and it's left to Ian, Barbara, and Susan to deal with what's happening. However, not as all good as soldiers from from the government start popping in, and. They capture Ian and Barbara and Susan and burn the house down, killing two of the two of the guys and leaving the doctor faint a mystery. Which then leads into our cliffhanger for part one. Now, before I continue, I just want to say the cliffhangers in this story is absolutely fantastic. Each of them leaves your heart pumping and wanting you to eagerly await the next episode, whether the next episode is good or not. Uh, that's all up to the viewer, but I think the, the cliffhangers are all very well handled in this story. So the Doctor is saved by a young by a young lad, and the Doctor then starts walking to Paris as he finds out that Ian, Barbara, and Susan are have been held prisoners in a prison, waiting to be uh, sent to the guillotine. Which, for those of you who don't know, um, years ago in Paris, when you got executed, what you do is you put your head. Um, underneath this thing and the chop will come down and your head will be chopped off. <laughs> the doctor's going to save him and he walks to Paris. However, these these few shots of him walking are actually the first location shooting of Doctor Who set. Um, I think they were filmed near London, but they're the first time the Doctor Who crew was shooting outside. It's not William Hartnell, um, but the guy who who does it does a very good job at imitating his walk. But there you go. So back in the prison, Susan and Barbara find a hole and they try and get out. However, rats come out and they've decided that they just can't get out. I thought that was pretty weak. And it, uh, you know, but there you go. Um, Ian befriends another prisoner who's dying and he tells him to find um, this guy who, and he gives him sort of like directions on where to go. However, Ian has no idea because he's just arrived here. There's a great shot when one of the one of the government people come in and Ian's just face to the wall. And when he gets asked questions, he just ignores them and just faces to the wall. 
and the guy puts his arm up to his to his neck like that and tell and demands that he answers, which is a very great intense scene. I especially liked it when um, how reluctant Ian is in his story. So back to the doctor. Um, he when he walks to Paris, he uh, bumps into a small group of diggers who, because they haven't been paying their taxes, they've been held sort of like prisoner. And there's this guy who's looking after them. Well, I say looking after. He's he's like the warden. He he basically sees if these guys are doing their job properly. And he has a chat with the doctor. And it starts off very nice. However, when the guy realises that this um, that the doctor isn't actually from Paris. And he hasn't been paying his taxes because he's just arrived. He actually puts um, the doctor sort of arrest. And told him to dig. However, the doctor comes up with this brilliant plan. Where they hide gold in the digging. They release his... Um, they tell the guy... And the guy thinking that there's treasure tells everybody to back off and he'll dig it. And the guy gets distracted because he's digging the gold. And the doctor then gets an axe and whacks him to the head. Now, the way it's shot, especially how it zooms into one of the guys, the other guy's faces, like, mm, and the thud in the background, it makes it implies the doctor killed this guy. <laughs> Very dark. However, um, you see the guy later sleeping on the floor and he's snoring, so he's clearly alive. He's probably got some sort of concussion. I mean, bloody hell, Doctor! <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> but then he is an old guy, and this is like a very tough time being set in the French Revolution. Oh, it's implied here that the Doctor is a huge fan of the French Revolution in terms of like historic, um, watching it in a historic way. Uh, Susan even says that if the, he found out they were in the French Revolution, he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't want to leave because he's such a fan of the French Revolution. I think this might, the story might have changed his mind. <laughs> and so the Doctor continues back the way to Paris. So this scene goes a little out of nowhere, but I'm sure that the Doctor's fucking brutal. Hooray for the Reign of Terror. Back to the prison, the guy who was talking to Ian looks um, at some sheets of paper and he crosses Ian's names out. So he won't be sent to the guillotine. However, Susan and Barbara are not so lucky. So they get sent to the guillotine. And the brilliant shot, the brilliant cliffhanger of the door of Ian looking through the gates. And he calls that Susan and Barbara. And the way it's shot, the slow zoom in on his face, very well handled. The director of this should be very proud of himself. Henrik Hirsch directed this story. Now this is the only story he directed. Um, there's a brilliant documentary on the DVD that explains how hard life was for him during during his time. He even passed out to direct in episode 3. And episode 3 was actually finished off by another director that we don't actually know who it was. So the rest of the story is directed by him. And he took a holiday after this. And I don't think he worked for the BBC again. But there you go. But he does a very good job, I think. He's very good at directing... Uh, doing slow camera angles and shots and catch capturing a very small set during uh, during the time when Doctor Who was originally shooting in its small studio space. I think at part, by part four of the story they actually made the set move to the to production to a much bigger studio. So that was a, that's a very nice story. So that when the Doctor arrives in uh, Paris. He disguises himself as like a higher up. He trades with this guy who sells clothes. Uh, he sells his clothes because you know because he's from the future. It's not very, it's very unique at this time period. So they swap clothes, and he pretends to be this higher up, as you can see on the cover. I really like this costume. I wish they kept it. I think it'd be very fat. Imagine how fabulous the Doctor would look in Planet of the Giants, where we're now. I think that would be very funny. But anyway, back then to Susan and Barbara, um, they get saved by these two, these two rebels. Now they, the way they're described is that they're not really in or for the war. They're just trying to save as many people as they can. Barbara tries to help up Susan because she's feeling ill. And Susan gets then sidelined a lot a bit. Um, Barbara then takes a big, big step in the story. Uh, she befriends this, this very suave man. This very suave man. I can't remember his name, but they seem to have romantic um, 
they keep eyeing each other and they're like romantic. So it seems like they're starting a relationship. However, Ian then gets out to the prison because the prison guard left one of the keys in, in the door. And he, and Ian um, opened the door. The, the, the guard was distracted by the guy who was um, talking to Ian, first of all. He, he asked for the guards for his help on some of the papers and stuff. So Ian actually got the key, got out, and is running through the city. Now, as this is happening, the doctor looks at the prison and stuff and finds out that that they're all being saved and stuff. And that's, you know, that's very cool. However, the guy that Ian was talking to, he actually sees the doctor and he asks him to meet up with one of the big heads, the, 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 the main head of this, this organisation. And the doctor then has a lovely chat with him about how they how they treat their treat the people against everyone. Now this guy seems very paranoid. I don't know if he's an actual historical figure, but he but he seemed pretty big um, political wise in this story. So mm -hmm. the doctor gets very. This is probably William Hartnell. William Hartnell, one of his greatest. A lot of people say that William that the. The difference between the first doctor with the other doctors is how they treat authority. Now, with William Hartnell, what he he's very author authority person. He would he could shout at somebody and they could do what they listen to. Whilst with the other doctors, if he if he tells people off, they they don't listen to him back and they normally consider him a spy and stuff. But however, this story he get, he gets a lot of shouting at people to do so. This is probably one of William Hartnell's greatest performances. Getting out a lot of shouting into other people's faces. Hooray! Two guys who saved um, Susan and Barbara, they actually get Ian and take him prisoner until Susan, uh, until Barbara realises that it's Ian and everyone's all happy and stuff. However, Ian says that they're looking for, he's looking for someone in Paris, the guy that the, that his prisoner friend who was who died um, is trying to look for so we can tell him to go back to Britain. To Britain. They tell him that they are that they're going to get a doctor for Susan because she's feeling unwell and get Ian um, to talk to that Ray Charman lad that Barbara was talking to and hope that he might know who this guy is. Now but Ian then meets with this guy and he is held at gunpoint, Ian is, because this guy is actually a traitor and he wants Wants nothing more to do but to kill the 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 governing heads. He wants nothing to do with with anybody who can even think about defending him. So he's been held prisoner, and that leads into one of our cliffhangers. Now it's important to note that episodes four and five of this were actually animated because they're missing from the BBT, BBC archives. They are made by, I think it's Planet 55. The Planet 55, they got their work from doing this short, like, anime-style Doctor Who trailer for the third Doctor, and it was really cool. And it actually got them to work on the Reign of Terror. Um, a lot of animation here, I think, is really good. However, it has two main problems. One is when they, when they close up with the faces, they have this weird technology where... Have you seen it when like, they take like a photo and they make their face animated? It's very awkward. It, it's basically that. It doesn't, it doesn't mind. I don't mind too much. I mean, I understand that it, this is a very short budget DVD work. So I understand. The other one is that it cuts all the time. It's like every three seconds it cuts, which is okay. However, it does kind of ruin some of the, the slower moments. As It seems like every moment is full of tension. Even when there isn't the story-wise, two characters could be talking normally and it'll just be cut in as if like something really action-packed is happening. So, very strange. But anyway, back to the story. Um, the guy who helps Ian and Barbara um, rescues them, he comes in and he shoots um, the suave man <laughs> and he... They then explain to Barbara that they have to kill him and he was a traitor. Now Barbara isn't very happy at this and she's a history teacher so she knows a lot about the French Revolution and she says stuff like, like maybe you should read a history book Ian before you can judge on who deserves to live and die 
and there's a lot of good people on both sides and a lot of bad people on both sides and he was just see it doing that guy was only doing what he thought was right so that was a very big big moment for Barbara and she and it brings back a lot of memories of the Aztecs I think it's even mentioned at this point that uh, she knows that she can't change history she knows she can't fight it but she is sick and tired of all the death that's been going around recently in Doctor Who. Um, a lot of stories have like loads of death in it and it's just tied her out and she's getting very down and depressed. This is why Barbara is one of the greatest characters. She, it's not like she blanks it out and she's like, oh look how wonderful and everything it is. I mean, she is that and she is, she does seem a lot of the good side of time traveling. However, she doesn't, she doesn't, have a blind eye to all the misery that each of the characters are going through. She really, she's just a very thoughtful person and she cares about others and you can see it in Jacqueline Hill's performance. Just a very, very well nice done job. So the Doctor then befriends this guy who who is keeping Ian prisoner and he then goes to uh, they have a little chat and then one of the cliffhangers is, is that this doctor goes to this house that they, they were all living at and he actually takes that guy with him and one of the one of the rescue people are like your friend is a traitor very very great classic cliffhanger and I love the shot of Ian and Barbara on one side and the doctor and this guy on the other side and the cliffhanger and the titles in the middle. It's a very nicely well shot story. However, in the last episode it's revealed that this guy is actually a goodie. He was the one that Ian is trying to get to. Um, because of his... He's actually a British spy getting ready for a war with France. And he has to be sent back to home to, to England to try and receive some... So they can have some very important information about the British. As this is happening, the revolution has begun and all the politicians are getting basically murdered by everybody. And that guy that the doctor was talking to earlier, he gets captured and he is shot very brutally. You see it, you, can, you hear it off screen as Ian and this guy go and trying to talk to him and he gets shot. However, what we don't realise is that Ian and Barbara, because they are from the future and they think, they actually know how this is going to end. Not well for for our, our group of comrades so they need to talk to they need to talk to someone uh, need to organize this this um this revolution so it goes as history is planned now they go to a bar and they get one of these politicians to talk to um, a military person to try to work out strategies and stuff now it turns out this guy is napoleon he gets a cameo in this story. It's kind of strange how Napoleon, a really big historical figure, only gets a cameo in a classic Doctor Who story set during revolutionary France. Very strange. It's a, it's a very small scene. It's very well handled. It's, it's nothing much really to talk about other than Napoleon's in it. And the Doctor doesn't actually know of these events, which I find really funny. Barbara and Ian keep it to themselves. I just thought that was really funny. So anyway, then after all that's done, the Doctor gets um, a cavern back to the TARDIS and they leave. And that's the French Revolution, uh, the Reign of Terror, sorry. It's actually called the French Revolutions sometimes because each of the classic Doctor Who stories each had their own episode title. And the main title was not really like an official thing until the DVDs and the videos came out. So uh, some people do actually know the story as the French Revolution. But this story is now called the Reign of Terror because that was what the French Revolution was called during the French Revolution. <laughs> so overall, it's a pretty great story. There's a lot of it's a very it's a historical story. There's no real villain. It's more of the surroundings and how and how these historical events are affecting our heroes. Very brutal time during Earth's history. It's a bit slow. I mean, Six Parts was was a lot of classic Who during the 60s. It's like six parts, and I think they could easily be cut down to four. This one could easily be cut down to four. Uh, 
But I think it is still great worth watching. And that finishes season one of Doctor Who. The first ever season of Doctor Who. This is the season finale. Um, overall, I think season one is probably one of the strongest series. It has some weak duds like the Sensorites and Keith and Marinus. But overall, there are some great stories and it has the Aztecs, which is one of my favourite stories of all time. So there you go. That's the Reign of Terror and season one of Doctor Who. So I'll see you next time. To get to some, we'll go to some audio stories before starting up season two. And I'll see you all next time on the Doctor Who Marathon.